Okay, welcome to oxygenation and ventilation of the COVID-19 patient. Uh, this is module two, and we're going to talk about uh, airway management. The products uh, shown in this demonstration are or for demonstration purposes only. Uh, the AHA does not endorse or recommend any of these specific manufacturers or products, and they may be actually on here just because I either have uh, more personal experience with them in my current practice uh, as a respiratory therapist. And so, um, and then we always recommend kind of personal protective equipment, uh, gloves, mask, and face shield, and I'll emphasize uh, airborne precautions, meaning an N95 mask or, or higher uh, capability to, to help, again, prevent aerosol uh, from contaminating the healthcare worker. Some of the objectives that we're going to review right now is that we're going to review the criteria of when to intubate, uh, re review an inventory of items needed to successfully perform an intubation for those with or suspected of having COVID-19. Uh, we'll discuss the risk mitigation techniques specific to COVID-19 uh, used to protect the healthcare providers. Um, and then we'll just kind of review manual ventilation devices and, and filter placement and some of the subsequent videos. So when to escalate to invasive uh, ventilation, there are several reasons to consider intubation of this COVID-19 patient population. One is that it develops a pretty uh, aggressive ARDS and they become progressively hypoxic. And so they tend to be more hypoxic than hypercarbic um, when it comes to that. And you also would consider escalating to invasive ventilation when you're non-invasive uh, items such as high flow nasal cannula, um, don't tend to work. And so there was a, uh, uh, a risk index uh, uh, called the ROX index a lot of times that helped uh, determine that when a patient is on high flow nasal cannula, uh, when they had a high risk of actually uh, requiring intubation, because that's one of the fears a lot of times is that you may wait too long. Um, and then when you go to do a rapid sequence intubation, this becomes a very ill patient and very difficult to um, uh, to actually get successfully intubated without an arrest um, or compromise. And so, so you certainly want to do it sooner rather than later. Um, and we're been, we've been advocating for early intubation. If you're using non-invasive ventilation, some of the common, common rules of, um, uh, of intubation in that population is uh, if you're on the 60% oxygen, you can't you know, uh, maintain a saturation of greater than 90%. And then some other general non-invasive uh, uh, modalities um, on any non-invasive uh, modalities, uh, such as you know septic shock, uh, if they're having a difficulty maintaining the blood pressure, those types of things, uh, worsening oxygenation. In other words, you put them on, but they didn't improve, um, then you probably should continue to escalate. Uh, hypercapnia, um, if they have a high CO2 and a low pH, uh, work or breathing that you just know that, hey, they're not going to be able to do this for very long. Um, and so you might as well potentially uh, and basically ventilate them. And then certainly altered mental status, uh, which is typically the hallmark a lot of times of respiratory failure is that um, if they change in their mental status uh, and you suspect it's either from high levels of CO2 or low levels of oxygen uh, hypoxemia, then you should intubate them. When it comes to intubating, this is a little bit different of a population because we want to reduce the ability to uh, cross-contaminate and, and those types of things. And so um, we are advocating for developing a, uh, a kit, if you will, um, that uh, allows you to, uh, to basically, in addition to your airway box um, or airway bag, those types of things, uh, gather all this equipment um, so that you can uh, have it outside the room um, and available to you so that you can use it. So one thing like a HEPA filter, so this helps protect basically the environment um, and the healthcare worker. Um, N95 mask, a couple different sizes. Uh, the full face mask, kind of the welder shield as some people call it, um, the ability for that. And this is mainly geared towards the intubator uh, to have that. Certainly, you can use the surgical mask shields over top of your N95 mask and those types of things, and they work pretty well. Um, you can also use goggles as well as your face mask, but the only thing we don't like necessarily about the goggles is that it does allow 
exposure of skin that's really kind of hard to wash your face and those types of things uh, after this event. We are advocating for uh, video laryngoscopes, for example, like the McGrath um, and the appropriate size blades, you know, um, Glidoscope is another brand and those types of things. And so you're, uh, that's something that we would ask that you'd actually have at the bedside um, that may not be in your airway boxes that you would bring to a normal uh, intubation and those types of things. Waterproof gowns is another one that is kind of a little bit more specific. Um, and that just allows, again, uh, if you're dealing with lots of aerosols and you tend to get wet and those types of things, that it won't soak through to your scrubs is really the goal here. A sterile gown, you know, uh, if available, and the, the waterproof uh, blue gowns are often sterile gowns, and so uh, those types of things are, are pretty helpful. You want to be able to cover your hair, um, and so uh, again, because aerosols, particularly for the intubator, can be generated and actually expose you to uh, the virus itself. And then if you have a long beard and those types of things, just remember the N95 masks don't typically work very well, and so you need to actually probably use a papper. Um, or, you know, frankly, shave your beard um, from that perspective. Some people like surgical gloves because it allows you to put, you know, a couple different types of gloves on so that uh, when you come out of the room, you can actually take off one layer or not to come out of the room, sorry. When you finish with intubation, you can take one layer off, clean up the equipment and still not expose your, yourself to, uh, um, to the environment. And then stuff that you, would not normally need is, uh, you know, uh, post intubation like batteries and stuff like that. And so ideal is to bring it, set it outside the room, only get the uh, equipment that you need and, uh, and take it into the room. And then once you're done with it, obviously all the disposables are thrown away within the patient room. Again, not, uh, don't bring it on the outside of that room. And then you want to wipe down the equipment uh, according to your uh, your policy and procedure for infection prevention, uh, as well as the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, and then don't forget to restock. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is uh, we, we often like to have a dedicated provider um, outside the room to help hand in equipment. And then you only want as few people as possible. And so typically you can safely intubate someone with three people, as we often say, but we often want to uh, advise you to have uh, additional people on standby if needed, but we just don't want to expose, you know, eight, nine, 10 people in the room for an intubation. Things that may be a little different, as I kind of mentioned before, is, you know, the N95 um, plus eye protection. And so this is kind of the recommended, you certainly can use the, the goggles, as I mentioned before. Uh, rapid sequence intubation, a true rapid sequence intubation, meaning we don't want to really into our bag valve mask these patients because, again, that's another aerosol generating procedure. Uh, we also are recommending that you use uh, video laryngoscopes um, and performed by the most experienced provider. Um, again, so that way it increases your uh, first time intubation success. You want to use these filters on the bag valve mask a lot of times, and so. Many of the heat moisture exchangers uh, are also filters, and you can put that between the mask and the, uh, the bag, but you can also put it between the ET tube and the bag as well. Um, and so if you take in like a roll of tape, then that, that tape needs to stay with that patient for their entire stay um, to secure it. And same thing with manufacturer holders. They typically are single patient use anyway, and so that's not uh, an issue. Other items that uh, may reduce uh, aerosols is inline suction catheters. And so this is something that I would also recommend that you take in with you because if they have copious secretions like we're told that they do, after you intubate them, you'll likely need to suction them and those types of things. And doing what they call an open suction technique uh, would only expose the healthcare workers um, to more aerosols that are being generated from uh, breathing and coughing and those types of things. And so. Uh, and then also allows you to keep uh, the, the ventilator circuit connected to the ETU tube um, and allows you not to uh, disconnect uh, very often. CPR during COVID, uh, obviously hand hygiene and PPE is really, really important. Um, and so 
we are recommending that you take the time to, to properly protect yourself uh, prior to entering the room. Um, and the goal is early intubation. Uh, if you do have to uh, bag valve mask, we're asking that you use a two person technique, meaning one person kind of helps seal the mask so that it doesn't leak um, and that there's a HEPA filter between the mask and the AMBU bag. Um, and then if you're unable to tracheally intubate, consider placing an LMA um, during that time period uh, to seal off the patient as best possible. Uh, another thing is that, you know, we've been advocating for doing lots of chest compressions and few interruptions, but this is a case where we want you to intubate successfully on the first attempt. Um, and again, to reduce aerosolization, uh, we're asking that you hold chest compressions uh, for the interim just for, so they can get the tube in and therefore you can move on. When it comes to kind of cleaning up after you've done, and so a lot of times it takes twice as long to clean up after one of these procedures than actually uh, doing the procedures, uh, you wanna make sure that, uh, again, you discard everything kind of in the room and, uh, and uh, so that it can be processed by housekeeping according to their procedures. Um, and that if there are anything reusable, uh, most policies require a two pro two-step process. One is decontamination, so that's getting off anything that's uh, obviously grossly um, uh, seen um, and those types of things. And then the second one is disinfection. Um, and this disinfection step usually requires a two to five minute drying time. And so what we're advocating for is that you clean it off in the room uh, with the, uh, the sani wipes or whatever in your particular hospital um, or employer provides you, and then you put it in a bag and write on it that you cleaned it uh, the first time, and then allow the person who uh, disinfects your equipment afterwards to do that process all over again, just to once again ensure that everything is properly cleaned. And so, and then if supplies of HEPA filters, you know, we're hearing that there's shortages of all different types of things. Um, if there's a shortage on HEPA filters, then uh, you can actually use the same HEPA filter that you had on the bag often on the mechanical ventilator that you're using as well. And then we just have a few uh, short videos uh, that you can go through just showing you actually how to put the HEPA filter uh, and a peep valve on. Uh, another thing that we're also recommending is the peep valve and then the inline suction catheter kind of indication and procedure.